Okay, so uh, Travis or Brent, do you got one of you guys want to go first? Brent, it's all you. I can go first because uh, my my kid interrupted here. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, let's see. Okay, let me uh, see if I can pull something. Okay. Okay. Gosh, I have a lot of things open here. Okay. <laughs> can you see my screen? I just see it. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is this is a really good case. Uh, you could say a textbook case that uh, um, that Art uh, Stillman showed me. Um, so here's the frontal radiograph. Let's blow it up a little bit. You can see what uh, on the frontal radiograph might be just mistaken for just th this normal kind of you know atherosclerotic calcification that you see um, around uh, the aorta, the proximal descending aorta. But then you realize that wait a minute, the rest of the descending aorta is you know hardly noticeable here. Let's take a look at the lateral here, and on the lateral, uh, you see this bulging contour that's calcified of the distal arch and, and proximal descending aorta um, around the area of the isthmus here. And um, you probably already de decided what you think this is. And uh, let's take a look at the CT. And you can see this saccular pseudoaneurysm arising from the proximal descending aorta uh, distal to the ligamentum here. And it has um, this really abnormal pattern of frond-like calcification that circumferential that really does not look like atherosclerotic calcification at all. Um, and let's take a look at the um, ribs here. And you can see that this person has had some rib fractures here uh, in the past. Uh, so this is a uh, post-traumatic aortic pseudoaneurysm uh, that is really, really uh, nice and classic um, on the radiograph and also on the, the CT. Um, I just thought that was, uh, thought Travis would like that because he's a connoisseur oh, yeah. of those. Well, the, just the, a really the classic. PA. What's that? Oh, yeah, go back to the PA here. Yep. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, the PA. The, um, yeah, it's amazing that he underwent a valve replacement and this was never detected or just left alone? Yeah, never detected, unknown. Um, and uh, this was recently, I don't have the post study, but this was um, stented. Um, you know, so and I know that there's, you know, <laughs> we all see these and we, some, um, there's, there, it's controversial, you know, stent or, or don't stent, but, um, you know, perhaps because the wall of this looked so kind of friable, so, um, but it's been around for, for a long time. Um, you can see the rib fractures here on this side, so I thought that was a great, great case. Um, the aortic valve surgery was unrelated. That was a separate um, diagnosis later on of um, aortic stenosis or something? Yes, as far as I understand, that was uh, completely separate and that this was uh, unknown. So, mm -hmm. so that you know, it's surprising, but <laughs> um, you wonder how many people are walking around with those, you know, because it seems like all of the ones that we've called about, you know, uh, have not been known, <laughs> you know. So it's very odd. Um, here's another uh, great case that uh, that Art Stillman also showed me, <laughs> um, and uh, we have. This young patient uh, who is 28 years old, I believe, a uh, young female, and let's, uh, she came in with some um, abdominal pain and has a known history here that I won't share for a second, but you can already see that up here the arch vessels have this soft tissue um, around them and the aorta coming down, the aortic arch and ascending and descending aorta all have this circumferential soft tissue and thickening here around the aortic wall and coming down you can see you can start to see that the pulmonary arteries have some stenoses and coming on down you can see that this long segment of the right main is abnormal and stenotic and um, get into the lower lobes and you see that there are multiple areas of occlusion um, of the 
pulmonary arteries that would look like just like chronic PE if you didn't have the rest of the case. Um, coming back up, we can see the the you know typical hypertrophy uh, dilation of the uh, of the uh, bronchial arteries here as collaterals. You can also see up here, stopping in this location of the right upper lobe, you can see uh, that there's sequela of a um, you know presumably a prior infarct up there. Um, and let, let's go down to the abdomen. You see some mosaic attenuation too that would fit with uh, you know these chronic occlusions of the pulmonary arteries. And let's go to the upper abdomen. You can see some um, soft tissue thickening of the aorta. You see collaterals coming up here, phrenic collaterals going up to try to supply uh, the lung. And then you also see some soft tissue thickening around the uh, left gastric, around the celiac um, axis here. And this is a patient with known Takayasu uh, arteritis who, um, it turns out, somebody came by to see me about this case uh, over here <laughs> in Midtown today. Uh, this is a great case. Um, but apparently this, this patient has had known Takayasu um, arteritis uh, for about, uh, you know, six or seven years and has been non-compliant with medication and, uh, you know, just keeps coming back uh, with more and more sequel of, of Takayasu. And um, this time she came back with some uh, abdominal pain. And I'm not sure what it's due to, but I, suppose, I suspect that her liver enzymes are a little bit elevated. Her liver is heterogeneous, and so I wonder if she has... Um, and hepatitis, whether that's, um, you know, an autoimmune phenomenon or infectious hepatitis, um, her enzymes are elevated. Uh, so I'm not sure that that, you know, fits with any of the findings in the chest. But, uh, but yeah, this is a really, really good case of Takayasu arteritis with uh, multiple pulmonary uh, artery occlusions and stenoses and, um, and arterial, obvious arterial findings, aortic findings as well. So any commentary about that? <laughs> The coronary ostea, are they okay? You keep, it looks like well, the left. Yeah, we, we looked at those, and um, there is some motion there, uh, but uh, we didn't see anything dramatic here. I'll go back to, um, you know, didn't see anything at the origin, and there's a lot of motion in the remainder of the the, left, the LED and the and the right as well. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was a pretty dramatic case of Takayasu. And uh, maybe I'll show one more case. This was another really good case here. Um, also that uh, Art showed me. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been racking these cases up. So uh, this was a uh, young patient who came in uh, with, um, I believe, some some chest discomfort. Not, not um, seeing it yet. Oh, sorry. Let me let me pull up the. Uh, let's see. Go to yeah. Sorry about that. Let me see here. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Um, young patient who came in with uh, some, uh, I believe, a cough and some chest discomfort, and you can see on the uh, on the coronal MR here that uh, there's uh, what looks like circumferential pericardial thickening. Uh, there's pericardial effusion. Um, this is T2 weighted, and let's and pleural effusions bilaterally. Let's scroll through the, uh, the survey series here. Uh, notice here that the pericardium is, is very nodular and uh, very thick, very, very thick. And we have, let's scroll up and um, you can see that there are some uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum. Let's go on to the, um, this is the four chamber uh, sine. And the, what strikes me on this case is that uh, if you're thinking about constrictive pericarditis uh, with the pericardial thickening, well, for this degree of thickening of the pericardium, where is the tubularity of the uh, ventricles? Where is the biatrial enlargement? Uh, the heart morphology is uh, is pretty normal here. Uh, let's take a look at um, the respirophasic series here, the real time. So we can see that um, with inspiration, uh, there is some deviation of the interventricular septum leftward, some leftward deviation but frankly not as much as you would expect for this degree of profound, you know, kind of nodular thickening in the pericardium. And let's take a look at the perfusion is pretty dramatic here. Um, let's get into the right series. Let me give you the four chamber perfusion. Look at this. Well, locked up a bit, but let me show you. Here we go. Okay, so on the perfusion, look at this. Let me play this. 
So look at these areas of nodularity of pericardium. They actually perfuse on the first pass perfusion. Uh, so let me show you the delayed enhancement, just really dramatic delayed enhancement. And just to cut to the uh, short story here, this was um, some of the lymph nodes, I believe, were biopsied, and um, this is large cell anaplastic lymphoma with pericardial involvement. So um, I just thought this, this was a, a great case, a great example of how this could have been kind of interpreted or mistaken for constrictive pericarditis, but it has multiple morphologic features of something else, <laughs> a pericardial uh, malignancy rather than just a constrictive uh, pericarditis. So any comments on that? <laughs> And sorry, do you have a tissue diagnosis yet or not? Oh yes, the, oh sorry, uh, um, it's anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Oh okay, thanks. Sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah. I cool. think I must have I must have faded out there for a second. But you can you know you can go back and you can look at the you know these enlarged lymph nodes, which are obviously you know another clue that this is you know uh, pericardial malignancy rather than just constricted pericarditis. But I just thought that was an awesome you know case. So. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Brad. Uh, she's a female who came into the emergency room uh, with numbness in the room. Does it help? Um, so this is the chest radiograph from two days ago when she was in the hospital. Um, so she had prior surgery and uh, you can make out these uh, uh, calcified lesions in the lungs and uh, the, we didn't have much history at the time of uh, this image. Um, and I'll show you the lateral. Calcified lesions in the lungs. And, um, so I will show you actually the MRI of the cervical spine and then we will go back and review this x-ray again unless somebody wants to uh, comment on this uh, left Sorry, lung. She has, she has some, some kind of the left apex? apex? Yeah, left lung apex. Uh, there is a density here which I didn't catch it initially um, and we have a MRI. I will just show it to you. Right. So, sorry, this uh, monitors are not well set up for teaching yet. So uh, we are trying to work on it. So you see the lesion is here. And uh, so this is the para, extra adrenal paraganglioma. So the patient has uh, extra adrenal recurrent paraganglioma. She has had it resected once before in this region. So basically she was referred back to her uh, doctors and NIH for further care at later time. What was the abdominal surgery? She had a bunch of clips in her upper abdomen. Yeah, she had a gist tumor removed. So she has a carny triad, yeah. Yeah, carny triad with extra adrenal uh, uh, paraganglioma um, and also so I think this uh, leucency is probably related to the pulmonary chondroma in this region with hyperleucency and then this uh, is kind of tough uh, I think retrospectively we, one can make out the lesion. So she has another incon or pulmonary chondroma in the right lower lobe there too and did she have a mediastinal yeah. paraganglioma is that why there's mediastinal wires? Uh, it is history sketchy she is just in here for the masters so we do not have all her uh, uh, history from NIH. That's a really impressive case. Mm -hmm. is, the, is there another enchondroma hiding posteriorly there over the spine or is that the, was that the one that was on the PA view low down? I think this one and this one. Yeah. Nice. And, and this is the paraganglioma at the top. 
All right, excellent case. That's the case for the week. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, uh, who's next? I can show a couple since I didn't show anything last week. That would be good. All right, you guys see radiograph? Yeah. Good. So this is this is one that I sent out to a couple of you, I think last week is a as kind of a perception challenge, and this is a radiograph I saw last week. And the PA view, there, there is a finding that may jump out, it may not initially, but certainly what I think when you compare to the prior, you can instantly see that there's something, some funny business here in the azigoesophageal recess. You've got a, your azigoesophageal edge or interface here, and now you've got this extra contour here. And then looking at the lateral view, the, the lateral view confused me a little. Now, this guy has a history of testicular cancer, and when I was looking at this, I, I saw that abnormality on the PA view, and then noticed that it's more overlying his left pulmonary artery that just kind of looks lumpy and bumpy. And this is his right upper lobe bronchus here, and what confused me was I thought that this was still part of the intermediate stem line here that looked normal. So I was trying to figure out why it looked like this was subcarinal uh, where did that image go? Why it was a subcarinal lesion here, but that you didn't really see much in the subcarinal space on the lateral view. But regardless, I you know thought that this was going to be lymphadenopathy. I think it's interesting that the oncologist was worried about recurrent testicular cancer, and so he got a radiograph instead of a CT. But they did get the CT last Thursday or, fr or Friday, I think. And here you can see is this big lymph node that accounts for the finding that was seen on the radiograph. And it is interesting that it does, you st still have a, a, an intermediate stem line interface here. So I think that's yep. kind of why you still see it. Correct. And this, this extends more superiorly and along the left pulmonary artery. Which, so it's essentially an overlay sign of the left pulmonary artery here, I think, because the PA you can kind of see through this thing. But anyway, this was their site of recurrence of their of their testicular cancer. So just a kind of a fun radiograph it, with the, yeah. Is it biopsy proved, Travis, or? That his, no, he's had prior retroperitoneal lymph nodes that are, that are biopsy proven, and his, his um, tumor markers are going back up. So uh -huh. it, it is not proven yet, but I think there is a very high index of suspicion. And there was nothing here on a prior CT. So. I don't, were you thinking of what were you thinking, David? Just another cause of a low attenuation lymph node, or or something well, else? It's really, I just um, want to make sure it wasn't a bronchogenic cyst, but it wasn't there before. It looks kind of lowish in attenuation. Yeah, and very and, uniform. Yeah, it's it's 40, 50, 60, 70 Hounsfield units in some areas. Well, that's yeah, it's not a cyst then. Yeah, no, I didn't pull up the old CT, but I had when I looked at the radiograph, I went back and looked at his CT and saw that he had some retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy at that time, which increased my my pretest probability that this was going to be a real finding on the radiograph. So, got it. Yeah, so that's my perception case for the week, and I've got three related cases that I wanted to show. I've been putting together a talk for Rankin Ray on aortic arch, different types of aortic arch anatomy, and I wanted to go through um, a couple of these and, and tease out some, some subtleties, because we've talked about different arch variants, and you know, this is one that a long time ago I used to think was a double arch with mirror image branching, but of course we know that this is a very strange configuration. You essentially have a four-vessel arch, and you have this, you know, what looks like a comeral diverticulum or some sort of dimple at least posteriorly located and you can see that there's essentially tethering of the left subclavian artery. So this is a young patient who was symptomatic from this vascular ring and no surprise went to surgery and ligated this and this was a double arch with an atretic segment which we've shown many cases of that kind of mimic a right arch with mirror image branching and so this is the probably the most common cause of vascular rings is the double arch, whether you have atretic segments or not. And I think one thing I always felt or found confusing was cases like this. Let's see, which one? This one. No, sorry, that one's going to be next. 
it is this one. So here's another patient who has vascular ring and had symptoms from it. And of course, this is the other cause of a vascular ring. This is not a double arch with an atretic segment, but this is an, a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery and a comoral diverticulum. They're a little bit older uh, and had some feeding difficulty, had some refractory wheezing that they originally thought was asthma, but was not. And you can see here that this is not a double arch with an atretic segment, but it's just a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery. And so the, and I was sometimes confused as to why these were rings, but it turns out the reason these are rings is because almost all cases of right arches, unless it's somebody with situs inversus, still have a left ligamentum arteriosum, which probably connects right here. There's a little bit of a bump, and it goes to the left pulmonary artery. And so I was glad that Brent showed that pseudoaneurysm case at the level of the ligamentum where it typically is, you know, anchors the aorta. And so this is another confirmed case, not a double arch, but a, a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian and a ligamentum with a diverticulum. And so they resected the diverticulum because we've had a few cases where they leave the diverticulum in and then it ends up causing symptoms on its own just from compression. And the one thing I was reading I didn't know either is the diverticula. And I know that Howard showed a left diverticulum of comoral that was just aneurysmal and that these diverticula are not normal aortic tissue, that they have cystic medial necrosis. And at least a few papers have pointed to that pathologically. And the idea is just that it's not normal aortic tissue because it's expected to regress. So this is the other cause of, of a vascular ring. And so the question is, well, patients with right arches with mirror image branching, why don't they have vascular rings? And the reason is usually they have the ligamentum off of the left subclavian that comes anteriorly. But I show that to set this case up, which is one I discovered in our teaching file here. And this is the only case of, of right arch with mirror image branching I've seen, three vessel arch, that doesn't have associated connective tissue disease, or sorry, geez, um, congenital heart disease. I'm thinking too many different things at once here. And you can see this is not a situs abnormality because they still have a right SVC. But what's cool about this case, and even patients with this may still have an atretic segment where you see a little dimple or diverticulum, but she does not. She's asymptomatic from this. And what was cool about this one is that you can see her, diver, or her ligamentum arteriosum on her going to her right PA. And so you can see a little ductus bump here, and this is at the level of the right PA. And I think that, you know, you can see where it's, where it's headed right here. And I thought that I was able to actually see on the axial images like a little, I don't know if I was hallucinating here, but it looked like maybe right here is a little cord going to the right PA instead of the left. So usually these patients still have a left ligamentum, but this patient has a right ligamentum, which I thought was cool. And it's something I've never really looked for before, but you know, from what I've read in surgical literature, almost all patients with right arches, regardless of the anatomy, have left ligamentum. Did you so, say it comes off the subclavian? Is that right? Did I hear you say that? Yeah, usually when it's a left, yeah, when it's a left arch or when it's a right arch with mirror image branching, in a, like a patient with congenital heart disease. And um, and usually, yeah. So this this is the only case I've ever seen. I, and I don't know if you guys have any mirror image branching without without a connective without congenital heart disease. It'd be interesting to see if you can find because I think it, it's pretty clear cut with that little the little. Diver, the ductus bump on the sagittal view, that that's where the ligamentum is. And I think you can kind of hallucinate it there, like right in here. Uh -huh. yeah, Travis, so, I have several cases of right arches with mirror image branching and no congenital heart disease. I, I have to go back and look at them now. That would be very yeah. interesting. And, yeah, and look and see if, yeah, what they, um, yeah, and if they're not, uh, if they're not atretic segments. Because, I found one, and, and I think it was Julie that sent you one, where it was a right arch with mirror image branching, but there was a little dimple or diverticulum back there that you know is indicative probably of a left ligamentum. So, all right, and then I'll show one more here. This came in on Friday, and I know that Brent and Art will love this case especially. I was at the VA, and I was complaining that it was a boring day of a bunch of lung cancer screening follow-ups, and then this came in. And I'm going to scroll right, first of all, to what they were wanting to evaluate. This is a guy who has AFib. He had a pulmonary vein isolation a few years ago somewhere else. 
including a, apparently a CT that was done at that time for, for vein mapping and, and nothing was commented on. But they had trouble engaging his left superior pulmonary vein, thought it might be stenotic and wanted to kind of document that it had been stenotic not from their procedure but from the prior one. And sure, the left superior pulmonary vein maybe gets a little tight here, but hopefully you're seeing on this image alone that the coronaries look really big. And whenever the coronaries look really big, it's important to look for fistula or abnormal origin. And look what this guy happens to have, which is R kappa, an almost right coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, totally incidental as an adult. Or not, I don't know if it's incidental. He might, he might have symptoms of steel phenomenon, but he was, uh, this was not diagnosed before this study. And so I think it's always nice, whenever you see huge coronary arteries, even if it's not a coronary CT, just look and see, is there a fistula or is there some sort of abnormal communication? Because this is essentially forward flow into the left coronary artery, then all of these collaterals connect to the right coronary artery, which then fills retrograde into the pulmonary artery because of the pressure gradient into the pulmonary circulation. But that's not it either on him. He also had a cute little patent ductus arteriosus. So back to our, you know, our ligamentum discussion here. This one looks like it's patent all the way, just a small incidental one. And then the other thing that was nice that you could see on him was just a tiny blush of contrast across his interatrial septum right in here, which was probably their puncture site from their, their uh, catheter ablation that they had done the day before. So this was a guy with three different cardiac abnormalities, none of which they were looking for, two of which are congenital. So it fits, it fits Caney's rule that when you have one congenital thing, you always have to look for another. So, yeah, so that made up for my, all the, the nodule hunts. So, all right. All right. I'll hand yeah. off there. Thanks, Travis. All righty, uh, David or Howard? I've got a couple. All right. Okay, can people see a rentgenogram? This is not a radiograph, it's a rentgenogram. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a, an obese woman with a, a BMI of 53 um, who has um, sleep apnea and is on CPAP at night. She has a big heart. She has a lot of osteoarthritis and has had bilateral shoulder replacements. So she has a lot of difficulty um, breathing at night. And you can see the big heart is part of what's taking up you know, her thoracic volume. When she lies down, she loses even more lung volume. This case was brought to my attention by Eric Stern, who, was, uh, who noticed on a CT scan um, that she has tremendous hypertrophy of her diaphragm. So he was impressed by the crura here. And another place to look for diaphragm thickening besides posteriorly here, the posterior part of the diaphragm and the, and the crura is on sagittal reconstructions anteriorly. So this is another very good place to look for diaphragm thickness. So she's got this tremendous muscle thickness here of her diaphragm all the way around. And um, on coronal view, you can see the extent of the the cruise part descending here on both sides. So really tremendous hypertrophy. She's, um, she's not a weightlifter. She's not doing respiratory maneuvers, you know, uh, that athletes do that might lead to diaphragm hypertrophy, such as trying to inhale against uh, tightened abdominal muscles, sucking in the gut, and then trying to breathe against that. As a matter of fact, she has a lot of atrophy of her chest wall muscles here and her paraspinal muscles. So she's not generalized hypertrophy here. And so I think this is the result of her obstructive sleep apnea. This woman works very hard, I think, at night to breathe in against an obstructed upper airway. I think that's the best explanation here for this tremendous hypertrophy of her, of her uh, diaphragm muscle here. So the way you get a strong diaphragm is trying to suck in air where the air won't go in. And so we've seen hypertrophy in this in weightlifters who tense their abdominal muscles and try to breathe against that, or people who have an obstructed upper, upper airway or who have chest wall or abdominal muscle, sorry, chest wall or abdominal wall stiffness from scleroderma or something like that that keeps them from being able to relax their abdomen. The diaphragm has to work against 
going down when the abdomen is not softening and, and taking up the volume by relaxing muscles. So in her case, I think it's hypertrophy from her sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back and look at other sleep apnea people. Now her obesity itself is, is something that could hypertrophy her her diaphragm just from the extra abdominal bulk that she has when she lies down her diaphragm has to work against all of that weight in the abdomen but in her I think it's the sleep apnea interacting with that because this is the most hypertrophy I've seen I've seen a lot of uh, obese people with modest degrees of hypertrophy but nothing like this okay um, <clears throat> switching to the other end of the uh, of the spectrum here is a um, student at our um, at, at, at uh, the university here who um, <clears throat> has this interesting cavitary lesion with a fluid level or a fungus ball in it in his left apex. I have a the sneaking suspicion I might have shown this case a few years ago but I didn't have it on my list of cases that I've shown. Um, and so he eventually had this lesion removed and um, his uh, <clears throat> his his interests were leading canoe trips and he had uh, taken people on canoe rides in places like Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, so there's some thought for a fungal infection around here. We do have coxie in Washington state now in the dry parts of the state east of the Cascades. But a lot of people here vacation in sunny parts of the world like California and Arizona and New Mexico and, and Mexico. So when we see a cavitary lesion and we're thinking infection, we think of coccidermycosis. But this lesion was resected and there were yeast-like forms in it and the diagnosis, Jeff, is blastomycosis. Ah, yeah. So, so uh, he, there he is in along rivers where we know blasto likes to be. This wasn't in Wisconsin, but it was Tennessee and Kentucky, places like that. So I think uh, the blasto range extends southward, but the, although the the state with the most cases is uh, Jeff's case, uh, Jeff State of Wisconsin. Yeah, if so you look at the CDC, it follows the Mississippi River, and some of the earlier case reports were more like uh, Western Tennessee and Mississippi. Your case uh -huh. is interesting because the cavity is very thin walled, more like a chronic coxy, whereas Blasto right. usually looks more like a lung cancer. Yeah. Okay. So. You wonder if that was on its way out. Yeah, I, what I've noticed before in these fungal cavities is that they tend to thin with time. So if you catch them early, they're thick-walled. Even coxie is thicker at the beginning. But when it's been there for a long time, it tends to thin out. So this probably has been there for a while. Okay, and then <clears throat> the last case is this um, fellow here with this interesting um, anterior mediastinal tissue here and a big pericardial effusion. And then on this abdominal CT, uh, it turns out he has these halos around both kidneys. And I um, was trying to see if there was something around the aorta. The aorta, despite the image processing here, I don't know. I don't know whether there's some extra tissue down here or not. It's kind of fuzzy um, thanks to our image processing. And then there's this extra tissue back here in the retrocurl uh, region as well. And there's some plural stuff here. <clears throat> and um, this fellow has Erdheim Chester, but he has not the usual BRAF mutation, which is present 50%. This guy has another mutation in that same MAP kinase pathway. So he has a MAP 2K2 mutation established on tissue biopsy. He had foamy macrophages and fibrosis in this tissue. This is, he also had a PET scan, and I would have expected that the, this abnormal tissue here would have lit up like crazy, but it did not. Um, it was, there was barely any uptake in this tissue, which suggests to me that uh, they had treated this guy with uh, interferon, and they probably quelled a lot of the acute inflammatory process, and were left with probably a lot of fibroblasts, which are not that metabolically active, so surprisingly, uh, lack of surprising lack of uptake on PET scanning. Um, he also had long bone uh, nuclear medicine studies which were didn't show any abnormal uptake. So the notion that most people with Erdheim Chester are supposed to have long bone disease, their 
tibias, fibulas, and femurs is based on the largest series of cases which were gathered at a bone clinic. And so that has skewed everybody's notion. In, in that series, I think 80% of people had bone findings, but that's because it was a bone clinic. So if you, if you detect your cases outside of people who are symptomatically um, reflecting their bone disease, then I think the rate of bone uh, involvement is much lower. So Erdheim Chester and negative results on PET, and I think that might reflect the interferon therapy. He's going to be transferred to, uh, to another therapy if they can get the insurance companies to pay for it that blocks this MAP kinase pathway, and that should result in some um, regression of this stuff, maybe unless it's all densely fibrotic at this point. So have you guys ever seen, had anybody else seen the PET scans in Erdheim Chester? I thought, oh my, my goodness, this is going to be fantastic, and it was just a big yawn. I'm not. I think one of my, the case I saw during residency, it was hot on PET. Uh-huh. And that was, that was before any treatment, so I don't know what happened. Yeah. Okay. Those are the three cases I'm going to show. All right. Thanks, David. Um, I just want to show a couple. I have a meeting in a little bit, so I'm going to, uh, I just want to show a couple and let Howard um, say for me. Let's see. Okay. Um, I thought, let's see. Oh, this is an, this is an odd case. And I um, pull it up here for you. All right. So I don't have a radiograph, unfortunately. I'm going to show you the CT. So this is a, patient who has a history of tobacco use, um, presented uh, with dyspnea, shortness of breath, and chest pain. And this is a CT angio. And I presume you can see my screen. And you'll see there's this large pleural collection in the right hemithorax, and the mediastinum is being pushed. And as we go inferiorly, you'll notice there is gas in this collection. And then if we go further down, you will note there is, change the window a little bit, there is high attenuation material layering dependently with gas contained in it in the pleural space. Uh, there has been no instrumentation or anything else. Um, the lung windows, you can see this actually is um, a right, well, actually, it's a bilateral pneumothorax, but a right hemohydropneumothorax. And you know, no trauma or anything like that, but he does have um, uh, a little bit of bolus disease. You can see on the left apex here from the cigarette smoking, and somewhere in the upper lobe on the right, either right here, you can see it. I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. You can see he's got some subpleural bullae here as well. And it was unusual in that to get a, this large of a collection, especially with all that blood from just a ruptured bulla in the absence of trauma. And they did drain this, and it was blood, and you know, got a, quite a bit of blood out of there. And his lung came back up eventually. And so I was talking to my one of our interventional radiologists was the one who who drained this, and he uh, asked me if I'd ever seen something like this, and I had to say I had not. So uh, he told me that um, he did finally dig up um, a radiograph here. I mean, a, a case report. Let me uh, see if I can show you here. There we go. And if you do a lid search, there's actually several little case reports, but this is another one here. Um, you should see this case report. This one's from 2003 from Europe, but they, they show uh, the same phenomenon here, these, these collect large collections. And the thought is, is that there's some scarring between the lung parenchyma and the pleura, and when the bola ruptures and the lung collapses rapidly it, or, or over time, it pulls away and tears. And there, because there's scar, there's a lot of sort of neovascularity. And then those bleed into this low pressure system. So has anybody ever seen a large spontaneous hemothorax in a patient with bolus emphysema or, or just even a little bit of emphysema? Nope, never seen that. Okay, well, that answered my question because I had never seen it. No one had ever seen it, so I, I didn't think it was that common. But it is an interesting phenomenon. And uh, it, it's probably it's not, it's so not, not bleeding from the intercostals, but rather little branches you know, for all that apical scarring we see. So that was kind of cool. And then um, another kind of 
crazy case. This is a, a youngish man. Uh, let me show you his CT. He presented with uh, fever and chest wall pain. He had been in a motor vehicle crash a week before, but had not sought medical attention. And there are a couple findings. First, you'll see this um, ugly collection, this extra pleural collection uh, anteriorly on the left. You'll notice there's abnormal appearance of his pectoralis muscles. There's thickening of the skin. There's, sub, there's stranding of the subcutaneous fat. Um, if I adjust the windows, you will see he does have, um, down here, he does have a sternal body fracture um, right here, going through it. And further down in his chest wall, he also has, um, maybe I passed him already, right in here. It, they're, they're a little hard to see, um, but if you window it correctly, you can see that he has these little pockets of fluid in the musculature there, a little bit of gas in here. So, I mean, this is all, and they actually drained these surgically, and this was all pus. So it's very odd for just from a traumatic fracture. He's got some rib fractures, and you'll see the first rib fracture. He's got a second rib fracture. Turns out this guy was actually um, an IV drug user and had staph in his blood. So the thought is he may have already been septic when he crashed his car, and that these broken bones were a good nidus for infection to develop. So, but this is a pretty bad case of chest wallitis. I don't know what else you would call it, but uh, with this extra pleural abscesses um, that developed about a week after a pretty bad trauma. I mean, he did have consternal and rib fractures there. So, uh, um, he Jeff, had, Jeff, do you think that thing originates from the sternal um, clavicular joints or the first rib? I think it, this one think originates it, from the first rib because there's the fractured cartilage right there. Uh -huh. And I think the lower down ones are in close enough proximity to the sternal fracture that that's where those were seated. Because those upper chest wall lo locations like that are favorite sites for, you know, staph infections. Yeah. You know, IVA. So yeah. it likes that area anyway, even if you yeah. don't crash your uh, your car. Was, right. it, was it a car or a motorcycle? It was a car. And when I was talking to the um, infectious disease doctor, yeah, that, that was their working theory that, you know, he, because he's an IV drug user, uh, you know, he was, he probably had staff floating around and this was just a perfect, you know, and probably keeping it at bay. And then this sort of tilted it to, in favor of the bugs and the bugs won in this case. But yeah, they just went in and drained them out and uh, took care of it there. But um, challenging. And then um, let's see, I got one more I might want to show. This is just a quick one, but I, I, I think you all will like this one. Let me pull up, share the screen here. So, the, and I'll show the, the radio a Rentgen gram first. Um, this is a lady with long-standing chronic disease, and you'll see she's got low vol, uh, um, hypoinflated lungs, small volumes, some linear stuff at the bases. But what's more interesting is the uh, soft tissue calcification around the shoulder joints, tracking down here. You may already have figured out the diagnosis. I'm going to show you the lung windows next, which will make you know the diagnosis. You'll see that we've got extensive traction bronchiectasis in the bases, uh, some reticulation. So she has NS, fibrotic NSIP. She has uh, long-standing systemic sclerosis, and this is all calcinosis in the soft tissues. You can see it along the musculature um, as well as up around the shoulder joints. And at first I was looking at this, I would wonder, well, could this all just be from joint disease? But if you look at the, 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 um, the shoulder joints, they're actually in really good shape. So I'd be hard pressed, plus it extends too far out of the joint capsule, but you can see it along the musculature there. It's interesting how fairly symmetric it is. Why, why that happens, I don't know. Almost looks like tumoral calcinosis. I thought this was going to be renal failure or something. Yeah, no, but she, has, she doesn't have renal failure. So, um, did you say scleroderma or did you or dermatomyositis or does she have some overlap? She has scleroderma. Wow. Yes. And remember, in, in what they used to call crest C was calcinosis. Right. But you're right. I mean, I've seen this more often with dermatomyositis and stuff. Well, okay. All right. Well, I'll let Howard go. Um, and I have some more for next week. Let's change the person here. All right.
right. I'm going to show you a really nice case that complements one that Seth showed us uh, last week. I think it was last week with the patient. Well, I'm going to withhold that history just for a moment. So let's start off this way. Scroll through very fast and you'll diagnose pulmonary emboli and their peripheral lung opacities consistent with a sequel of pulmonary hemorrhage and or hemorrhagic infarction. And you may already have seen something a little bit odd, but let me just bring up the thins and scroll through some of these bigger emboli a little bit more slowly. And just look at this one, for example. It doesn't look like the usual embolus where there is a polo min sign where the embolus is sitting in the middle of the vessel, surrounded by contrast medium on all its sides. Some of them do, but this is pretty extensive. So extensive emboli, but then you're, some of you probably already seen this that this here in the right atrium should not be there. Here is the ultrasound of that. So I'll play that and you can see the mass in the right atrium and kind of flopping through the uh, valve as you can see there. So this is a nexoma. Um, and just like Seth's case, fragments of the nexoma have undoubtedly broken off and gone into various places in the pulmonary arteries. Here is um, some additional information. This is the context here is the Carney complex. So there is a history of a son that was diagnosed with that. And the patient has lots of freckles, so that's part of the pigmentation abnormality. She has the myxoma. And then I will show you some images of the operative specimen. And you can see this is where it was attached to the atrial wall, but you can see how jelly like this stuff is. And on histology, there's lots of villous histology. So it's easy to conceive how pieces of this thing can break off and embolize into the pulmonary arteries. And that's kind of similar to uh, Seth's case. So the chronic complex has myxomas, it has skin lesions, they have endocrine abnormalities, all kinds of things in the adrenal glands and the pineal gland and stuff like that, as well as the skin lesions. And it's obviously different from that that we just saw, the Carney triad. So this is a really nice example of a myxoma in the Carney complex. That embolized. That's pretty impressive. We got both. We got two carnies in in one hour. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. And I was kind of hoping that we would get a follow-up <clears throat> imaging exam in this patient. She had surgery, which was lost to follow-up, because I wonder over time what would happen to these things. You know, how many live cells you have? Could it continue to grow in situ? Because it's viable tumor. Sometimes these things, like on the left side can embolize to the brain and grow in the brain. And I don't know if anyone has ever seen persistent growing fragments of myxoma in the pulmonary arteries, for example, over time. But we never got a follow-up, so I don't know what happened to these things. All right, I liked the, the coronary CTA where you showed there was very slow flow in that left interior pulmonary vein because of all the obstruction of the uh, lower yeah. pulmonary artery. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. can see the asymmetric flow there. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, pretty impressive, huh? Hey, Howard. Yeah. Howard, was was this? Um, do you know if if uh, they also treat her? I mean, obviously, a lot of the, most of this is tumor, but I always have a question that you know, how much uh, does this serve as like a lead point for uh, thrombus formation? So, did they do they actually treat her at all with? Um, you know, come in or did they just assume that all oh, this was, was tumor? Um, I don't think they discharged her on anticoagulants, as best I remember. Okay, okay. Yeah, that I remember. The low attenuation of a lot of this stuff in the pulmonary arteries makes, makes you think it's really the mixtoid material rather than thrombus. It's got some nice low attenuation, I think. I think that's yeah. real. 
Yeah. Now, how low is it? Uh, the stuff here, we can measure that, get a feel for it. Let's say I pick a spot here. That's around 38. That measures around 40. That still could be acute PE. But but I agree with I mean I agree it looks like it's yeah. or it's embolized myxoma. Yeah. Don't you think the irregular interface between the contrast blood around it's like got fronds in it and it's irregularly shaped in the funny pieces that sure. go like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was very impressed by that. All right, let me show you an interesting case, this one here. So the history with this patient who came in was respiratory distress, and they said hemoptysis. So I'll just give you a moment to look at the chest radiograph, and you'll see in a moment that none of us really picked up which something that is, in this patient, um, significant. So. You know, the lungs don't look entirely normal, but they're not floridly abnormal, at least on this radiograph, as best one can tell. But she did have a CT, which is pretty abnormal. So I'll scroll through this. So we have a lot of diffuse, confluent ground glass and consolidated opacity, but mostly ground glass. But in addition to that, for example, up here, there are also very conspicuously septal lines. So there is septal edema. I'm not sure and if we look at the bronchi, perhaps there are peribronchial fluid cuffs. Okay. If I have some thinner cuts for you, this will be better. So I'll scroll through there, and you'll see. Yeah. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. 